Hello everybody. Happy New Year 2023. Um, I don't know whether it's going to be a particularly happy New Year, but I know it's going to be very eventful. So um, this first video of 2023 is really uh, a purpose beyond just the simple content of another video being posted on YouTube. This video is going to be a little bit longer than most, um, but what I want to do is with the aid of this uh, whiteboard or improvised whiteboard behind me, I want to actually go through um, the agenda that Freeman Legal Services, myself and Weirbank are trying to propel you towards uh, over the, the first few months of 2023. And in order to do that, what we first got to do is give you a historical perspective of why you are here or where you are um, as far as the country or the sovereign nation that you are purported, purportedly dwelling in um, exists and wraps itself around you as it does. Now, in order to do that, we've got to go back in time. And for the purposes of this example, we're going to use the United States of America, or as they were originally were called, the colonies of the, uh, the Great British Empire, uh, right the way back to around about 1760, 1765. And then we're going to progress that scenario right the way through up until around about 1945 which is where it's going to finish, that's going to be part two. So from 1945, right the way through to present day, that's going to be part two. This is part one. Um, how we're going to begin is I'm going to go back in time, as I've just said, um, because what we're trying to do is give you uh, an overall idea, particularly, as the United States is the example we're using here, of why there is no rule of law anymore, why the national debt is as extravagant as it is, and why nothing that you seem to say or do to the congressmen or senators that represent you mean anything at all, why you are ignored, and why you have no joinder or position or standing within the, um, the nature of government, and why there is no Constitution of the United States, why the national and domestic laws of the countries that you are in, whether it's Australia, Canada, or the United Kingdom, France, or Germany, are applicable. And in essence, where we're leading to on this in the part one is up to the bankruptcy. The bankruptcy of the world in 1945, following the 1944 Bretton Woods Financial Agreement. So join with me now as we go back in time and I'm going to use the board to give us some idea of where we're, where we're heading. So we're going to start at around 1760 in the, the colonies of the USA. And the colonies are, were largely independent in those days, very much looking after themselves. Um, but then around about 1765, um, there was something called uh, the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act was introduced in 17, just make sure I've got it exactly right. Yeah, 1765 was something called the Stamp Act. And what this was, was an attempt by the British to impose taxes on the colonies. And that didn't go down too well, and it was followed by another act called the Townsend Act in 1767, which uh, was the preliminary um, tinder that led to something called the Boston Massacre, where the, the colonists, as they were called, uh, basically protested, and in uh, 17, I think it was 17, yep, 1770, there was a massacre. Now, why this is important is it shows that the British Empire and the British banking control that was in control of Europe and the Great British Empire, or the British Empire as it was then, was trying to exert control and dictatorship over uh, a, a fairly peaceful bunch of people that in the main had left Europe for a sense of freedom and uh, independence. 
So what we're coming to here is a very, very early stage where the banking cartels were trying to get a grip, i.e. put their fangs into this, this new world um, enterprise, which they knew was probably going to be very, very profitable in the future. So leading on from that, really, we ended up in 1776, which was the Declaration of Independence. So the Declaration of Independence was mainly an original 13 states uh, of, in the United States who came together and declared their independence. But at the same time when this was happening, um, there was a, a war going on. And this seven-year war ending in 1783 resulted in the first... Uh, publicized debt by the Treasury in the United States, and that sum amounted to then $43 million. Okay, so that's where we were. Now, in 1791, the Constitution, 1791, the Constitution was ratified. And in 1791, after lots of pressuring, the Bank of the United States was formed. Bank of the United States. Now, that's very important because... The Bank of the United States was none other than a Rothschild Warburg Schiff banking operation. And what was given to it then in 1791 was a 20-year charter. 20 years. So that's taking us then up to 18... Uh, sorry, 1791 gives us uh, 1811. So at 1811, that's when the charter expired. And because of the way that the money supply had been managed, the founding fathers, or those who'd replaced the founding fathers, saw that it was none other than an operation to milk the country and the people dry. So they refused to renew the charter. And lo and behold, what happened? In 1812, we had a war with the British. 1812 war with the British. Now, due to this war, what happened is this Bank of the United States that they had refused the charter on, on a renewal, around about two-thirds of the interests in that original Bank of the United States were controlled by British interests. So no, no wonder the people in the United States, having declared their independence, saw the way that this was all leading. So Alexander Hamilton managed to pay down the debt that had incurred from this war. Uh, he managed to drag it down in about six years. But in effect, what happened then, this war escalated the debt from 43 million escalation of debt went from 43 million to about 120 million. That's in dollars. Payable in gold, by the way. So what you can see is that this reoccurring theme is, is debt. So the question then becomes, if this debt was debt, who is loaning the money to who? And both sides, in effect, are parties to the banking, um, the banking system's well-worn and very successful methodology of lending money to both sides of a conflict with the understanding in contract that 
Whoever is the winner picks up the debt or the tab for the losing side. In, on condition that they allow the banking cartel to manage the money supply. That's very important. This is why from the founding of the United States prior to say 1760, why we've got a, a, a constant series of uh, turbulent events, panics and wars. Why other would they do it? These people went there for peace and quiet and enjoyment and all they got from it was, was war. So why is this war agenda so important? It increases debt, as you'll see. So, the charter was refused, and then we've come from this war, but we're coming into something now, was the next event, which was called the panic, financial panic of 1819, brought about by the bankers, and then we drift conveniently into the civil War, again, another war which ran from 1861 to 1865. Two main things happened here. Uh, Lincoln was assassinated after he imposed a 3% uh, income tax. So we've got Lincoln... Lincoln assassinated because he also didn't want the, uh, the European monarchical controlled banking families and the likes of the Rothschilds, the Warburgs and the Schiffs to be involved in printing money. So he was gotten out of the way. It's very interesting that he was gotten out of the way in a very similar way that happened in 1963 when Kennedy was assassinated because the, uh, I think it was Wilkes Booth who assassinated um, Kennedy. Um, and then what happened is uh, this Booth individual was actually born in Britain, so he was arguably a British spy or agent. He shot Lincoln, and then, lo and behold, um, the people that went out to... Uh, to to uh, apprehend him or arrest him. They were given very specific instructions, supposedly, to take the individual alive. However, uh, one of the, the guys who was uh, interested in, in, in this, um, this capture actually shot him dead on the spot. And so what we had is, very conveniently, the individual who'd shot Lincoln out of the way just like was the situation with the, um, the Jack Ruby Oswald incident with JFK. So it's the same old uh, principle, it's all the same old theater play, and often they use the same techniques and the same tricks to perpetrate their agenda and cover up their, their tracks. So we've gone through now to 1865 when we now have the cost of this war escalating now. Um, and the cost of this was approximately 5.2 billion. So we have, as you can see, debt increasing at every level and the same pattern. So what I'm trying to address to you here is the debt, the austerity, the amount that you seemingly owe and what you're bonded to just gets higher and higher and bigger and bigger until certain things come along which can dissipate it. And what that dissipation is, is to get rid of the people that the money is owed to. They can do it in one of two ways. They can create like a depression um, and bankrupt the people and take into their possession the ownership of property and movable goods, or the other alternative is a war. And as you can see, wars seem to be very popular. And it isn't because you think they're popular and want them, or your neighbor down the road thinks they're popular. It's because some other external agency that is um, benefiting from them and never gets involved in them, and the fact that the senator's sons never go to Vietnam um, syndrome, that you're in a very, very difficult predicament and it's not getting better. So 
Part of this video education here is to try and get enough of you out there to realize or wake up to the fact that unless things change, unless we begin to reverse by 180 degrees the way we think about those that govern us, this is just going to continue and continue and hopefully stop. So following this, we come up for a small period where then in 18... 1873, we have what's called, again, the 1873 Panic. Now, we're not long after the, the Civil War here. This 1873 Panic was triggered by something called J. Cook Bank going bust. And what that meant is that this panic cycle lasted from 1873 to about 1880. And in that time, approximately one quarter of all the railroads, which was big business at that time, one quarter of all the railroads, and that's railroad companies, were foreclosed on. Around about 14 to 18,000 businesses were foreclosed on, and we had unemployment between 14 and 20 percent. At the time of the Great Depression, so called, 1931, about 33 percent of the population were unemployed. So it it gives you some indication here of what was happening here. So why all these blows? It's an incessant battery of blows, hammer blows, being delivered to people on a continent far, far away from Europe. But what we have here is the tentacles of the international Zionist bankers, which are not to be confused with Jews or Orthodox Jewry. These international bankers are simply looking for control. They want ownership of the property. They want ownership of the land. Whether it's supposedly sovereign or not is irrelevant. So what we come to then is, uh, we must also remember, in, uh, in this period here, we had income tax introduced. We also have a point here, uh, 1815, 1815 here was the Battle of Waterloo in the UK, or sorry, in, in, in Belgium and France, where Napoleon was defeated. So this 1815 point, as you see, ties in very, very nicely with this war that the British were waging also on another front to take control of the United States. Income tax was introduced here in the United Kingdom or uh, in the early part, I think it's around about 1806, as a temporary measure to fund the war. Equally, with Abraham Lincoln here, a 3% income tax was introduced as a temporary measure, which was later abolished, but only for it to come back in. Once the wedge has been inserted into the, uh, under, under the door or in the crack, it never gets removed permanently. Uh, so, 1867, um, which would put us in around about here. So, 1867, what we had is the founding of a bank in the United States. Uh, it was called Kern Lube. So, it's Kern, Lerb and Co. Introduced in 1867. That was amal an amalgamation of banking families. It was an amalgamation of the Warburg family with the Schiffs. And what happened is, I think it was Frieda. Let's just check. Yeah, uh, Jakob Schiff. And I don't have her name exactly, but that's not going to stop us much. Uh, yeah, sorry, Felix. Felix Warburg 
married Frieda Schiff. Now, what is important on that point is that the, as I mentioned before, the Warburg family were a family 200 years older in tradition than the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds started their banking operation maybe around about 1774, 1776 in Frankfurt, but the Warburgs, uh, their first, um, I think it was Simon Kessel, I think one of the, the founders, around 1500, where they started as um, uh, Jewish bankers in, in Spain. They moved from Spain to Bologna and then eventually to Warburg in Germany. But the Warburgs were part of what's called a Venetian, Florentine, Genovese, double bookkeeping, uh, banking jewelry that were in effect um, the people who lent money to monarchs, to regents, to potentates. Uh, wherever money was required, they would lend it. So there's a very, very good chance that one of the major helping families with the Rothschilds and the Federal Reserve was really the Warburgs behind or in association with uh, the Rothschilds. But why this is important is the railroads. The railroads from uh, around about 18, 1812, when this war was in, 1812 up until, let's say, 1886 or so, what we had here is that the banking families were in charge of funding the railroads. The railroads were necessary to open up the United States for something what was thought then of or called or terminated, uh, sorry, termed manifest destiny. Manifest destiny was this belief that the righteous uh, Protestant type ethic for the, the white people who'd invited themselves into America had a, a manifest destiny, a calling by God for them to expand and move west. And as they'd all arrived on the eastern seaboard, the only way to go was west, but there was a problem. Two problems, really, which you've got to remember who funded the government, who is paying for the soldiers, who's paying for the railroads, who's paying for all business and trade that moves? The bankers. So, what did we have? We had a very unfortunate situation that the Native American Indians who stretched over mainly the central plains of the United States and going north towards Canada were in the way, especially if you wanted to drive railway lines east to west. Also, we had another problem for the railway companies and the government and the people who wanted to make money indiscriminately, and that was there were around about, yes, 80 million bison or buffalo occupying the plains of America. These herds were so large that once they started to pass a point, it might take two to three days for them to pass uh, in continuous movement day and night. They were therefore a problem. So what was decided by the banking families in collusion with the United States Army is to do two things. One, eliminate the Native American Indians by taking away their source of food. Don't forget that the bones from the bisons or buffalo were used for creation of tools. Their skins were used for the building of the teepees and clothing and the meat was used as an indispensable source of protein for them to eat. Uh, even the dung from the buffaloes was used for the lighting of a fire. So what happened then is there was a wholesale eradication of the buffalo. Um, troops were brought in, hunters were paid, uh, because the main expense was the, the, the shells, they were actually paid to slaughter these buffalo by their thousands and thousands and thousands each week. So this slaughter uh, meant that by 1880 or 1886, there were probably no more than a few thousand buffalo left. They were nearly exterminated. And so um, that gives you some idea that uh, this pursuit of money, this pursuit of hegemony, this pursuit of banking control is at any cost. And if people will just slaughter indiscriminately 
these animals and ensure that the native populations of that country were just eradicated and then put onto reserves doesn't mean uh, anything other than they won't think twice about having you in debt and having you uh, dispossessed from your house or property. So we've got to that point um, there. I think the next point, though, is that we move on now um, to something that was never revoked here. And in 1861, there was something called the Emergency War Powers Act, which is still in force and was never repealed. So we have that as an ongoing trading with the enemy um, declaration that in effect the United States is still very much on a war footing and the enemy is none other than you. We won't go into too much detail as to why that is the fact because that is going to be coming in, in part two. So we've come here, 1886, just coming up to the turn of the century and what we then have is around about 1900, we have the beginning of quite massive um, technological advances. Uh, one of the main uh, architects of this was none other than Nikola Tesla. Um, Nikola Tesla started his, his research moving from uh, Eastern Europe. I'm not sure whether he was Romanian or Bulgarian. Tesla came over to the United States and began his, his initial experiments. And he was being funded by, I think it was Jacob Astor. Jacob Astor the um, Sixth, uh, who was also funding uh, organizations like Westinghouse, and uh, the drive for electricity, other than DC current that Tesla was providing or proposing for free energy, free electricity to be delivered over in the United States, was something that the banking community didn't want. But this is where we had it, and so we're coming up here now to. Another major and massive event we've got in 1912, following the bankers paying for the eradication of the buffalo, from the uh, bankers paying for the railroads to be pushed through, and for the Native American Indians to uh, be battled or slaughtered into the ground and then put onto reserves where they would be controlled. We've got something else now, which we're fast approaching, what's called the Roaring Twenties. But in 1912, what we had is the sinking of the Titanic. Incredible. Everybody's heard of it. On its maiden voyage, uh, a Masonic indication of the company that was running it is what's called the White Star Line. Um, the White Star Line, or that White Star, is always a, a pattern of... Um, uh, Masonic control. It's on the flag of the United States. It's on the flag of the, the Chinese Republic. It's on the front of, of uh, on the, the flag of the Koreas. It's on the flag for the Lone Star State of Texas. Um, wherever you see that white star being displayed, and it's on many flags, like the flags of Pakistan and many of the Indonesian countries. It's a representation that the Freemasonic orders of the Blue Lodges are fully in control and um, very similar to the, the hand sign that a lot of people on interviews give, which is a bit like that, which is an indication of a, of a, of a triangulation and representing the Great Pyramids. So we had the Titanic sinking. We had very influential people on there that were against something that's coming up in one year's time and that they were trying wholeheartedly to stop and that was the founding and the charter that was going to be given to the Federal Reserve almost, uh, was it, a hundred years after this initial charter over here had been revoked. So these people work uh, diligently, consistently, behind the scenes, um, just like termites burying un into the wood in your house. They aren't looking to achieve it all in their lifetime, but achieve it they, they propose to. So the Titanic went down, 
people like the Morgan Pierpoint uh, entourage that were booked on uh, mysteriously cancelled due to ill health the day before it sailed. And so all the people that were primarily objection, uh, ob objectors to the Federal Reserve were moved out of the way. And in fact, this um, uh, Jacob uh, Astoria, I think, Jacob Astor the sixth, who was the chief funder of Nikola Tesla, was also on board. And when he, when the Titanic went down, that went down, and Tesla, in short, had his uh, work foreclosed on because the debts couldn't be paid, and his uh, his patron and his uh, his uh, overseer was out of the way and therefore gone. So in 1913, when there was not a full quorum in the uh, Congress or Senate because it was Christmas Eve, 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed and the Bank of America Corporation was rehatched here on, on that day, or on that date. So we also was yeah very interesting that to coincide with this the world knowing that the main families involved were jewish the jewish anti defamation league was also founded in 1913 so that anyone uh, saying anything anti-Semitic or anything against Jewry, world or international Zionist Jewry, would be prosecuted or be brought to task for condemning. So, not a coincidence. Uh, Christmas Eve 1913. Um, so, very conveniently, why was this, this 1913 date, a very important date for the founding of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve Act. And just for those of you who can't read this, then uh, there's the facility obviously on your, your, um, your YouTube or on your uh, uh, touchscreen to, to make things a little bit bigger, and we might try and zoom in at the end before we, before we finish. But the Federal Reserve was founded in 1913. Did they know something was going to happen that we didn't? Of course they did, but they knew one thing, and one thing for sure, that in 1914 to 1918, there was going to be a world war. The first world war, as they called it. Um, and that, obviously, continued and imposed enormous amounts of debt. The United States initially didn't want to get involved in it, but they were sucked in because they'd had to be sucked in because of the interconnectivity of the, the banking network. Even then, it was the same families providing the, the money or the promissory notes. All of this being backed in gold, by the way, up until 1933 in the United States. So we get to World War I, and we are in a situation now where we're coming into the, putting the kerosene in the basement ready for the next setup. Because from the end of 1918 to the beginning of World War II, we had a 20-year period, which was nothing more than a truce. It was, I think it was Lord Northcliffe or Lord Northampton actually said that this is not a, uh, an end of the war following the negotiations in the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. This is nothing more than a 20-year, it was nothing more than a truce. So, Sure enough, because of the extensive reparations that were loaded onto Germany, don't forget, Germany, France, all these countries were virtually, uh, had no money by now. So it makes you wonder who's paying for the next war. Where's World War II going to be funded from or by? Okay, because the United States are broke. Britain has been leached dry. France, after the defeat of Napoleon in 1815, no more money. The same in Germany after the First World War. Devastated. The same with Holland. The same with Belgium. 
The same with the colonies. There was no money. Where's the money coming from? Where did the money come to bring Germany from a defeated power in 1918 back to a fully armed, ready to go organization in um, 1939? It couldn't have been the Americans. America was declared bankrupt in 1933 when the Federal Reserve closed or foreclosed on the Treasury. Britain was bankrupt in the Second World War. So, questions? Very obvious when you look at it in a, in a, uh, a condensed historical perspective. What you need to appreciate is look at the wake behind the boat. Who's driving the boat? Yeah. What are they leaving behind on this boat? Yeah, And who's driving it? Who's controlling it? It's not you. You're down in the engine room um, just hoping that the captain doesn't say Pop, throw, more, throw more coal or put more uh, fuel in the, in, the, in the boilers. Because that's what you're doing. You're preoccupied. But the people who are controlling the, the deal or the, the upstairs are steering it just where they want. It doesn't go by accident. Uh, even to the extent of um, uh, Roosevelt, which we'll talk about why he got uh, actually uh, assassinated um, just before the end of the, the Second World War. But the Fed, so we had World War I, and then what we come up to now is from 1920, just after the war, to about 1929. Sorry if this is getting a bit difficult down here, but... Up until about 1929, we had the bankers increasing the money supply and giving money to whomsoever wanted it. If you wanted it for this, you got it. If you wanted it for a Model T, you could probably get it for a Model T Ford. If you wanted to invest on the stock market, if you wanted it for the speakeasy or to, to transport booze across state lines, you could get it. So that's what they were doing. They were loading it all up for nine years until the stock market crash, the bubble crash of 1929, which led to the Great Depression, 1931. And then that led then on to 1933. 1933, which was the gold conf Confiscation Act. So 1933, Gold Confiscation Act. What used to be the situation is prior to 1933, if you had a promissory note, then that signified that you owed the bank. After 1933, it showed something completely different because now gold and silver was no longer um, lawful. The Federal Reserve had taken over completely by 1933. And what they did is the Federal Reserve demanded now that it got paid in gold and it foreclosed on the United States Treasury. And that's why there was the Gold Confiscation Act. The price of gold, uh, what's called jumped or stair-stepped, around about three and a half to four dollars. People handing their gold in were given fractional reserve notes by the Federal Reserve and only given about 59 cents, I think, on the so-called dollar exchange rate. And so immediately we were in two problems. So that brings us to roughly where we, we need to go. Um, the Great Depression, and then giving time for Germany to rearm up till 1939 puts us in then to a world war. Now, I don't call it a world war. I call it a war on the world. So we had a war on the world stage one, a war, a war on the world stage two, and then this uh, this culminated in, in, obviously, the Allied powers coming together. So who are the Allies? So I'm getting now to the final point uh, on this part one that is very important and is leading us into part two, and this is the following. Prior to the end of the Second World War, 1945, right, what we had is 
many years of negotiation, backroom deals and preparation for uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944, which was called the Bretton Woods Financial Agreement or Financial Arrangement 1944, where 44 allies, yeah, not Axis powers, not those on the other side, the Axis powers, 44 of them, came together as the initial signatories and then later it totaled 103 countries all entered into voluntary bankruptcy. The voluntary bankruptcy was never announced to the public, but this was really the iron fist in the velvet glove that the bankers offered. Don't forget, for anyone who thinks this isn't correct, the initial agreement for Bretton Woods to all the parties who were involved was that they would hand over their gold supplies or their internal currencies in certain ratios in return for a, a, uh, a backing of the, um, the agreement with United States dollars and a pooled gold front. But that was only for 30 years. They promised that they would return their gold in 30 years. So if we go from 1945 and put 30 years on it, 45, 55, 65, 75 was the maximum window, or if we say it from 1944, it was 70, uh, 74 was the window. What did we get in 72, 73? We got the Nixon shock where overnight, President Richard Nixon basically detached all repayments of United States dollars in gold. That was the trick. They never, the bankers reneged on that deal in Bretton Woods with all these countries that were beaten down and bashed and in war. They bolted it down good and proper in 1944. And don't forget, 1944, what did it see? The Allies, who were the 44 Allies, became what's called the United Nations because they were united. Uh, united Nations formed the International Monetary Fund and the International Bank for um, uh, Redevelopment, which was the World Bank Group. So what we had then is everything coming into place. Everything today that is mysteriously looked at as a bogeyman or as a threat to, uh, to freedom of the individual and the freedom of your, your lifestyle and the natural rights of man all came out of that one event because they knew that the people were spiritually, morally, uh, legally, socially absolutely destroyed by two world wars within 20 years of each other. And so this is what they did. They moved to what's called rebuild the peace following 1945. <coughs> and that was going to be the way that they were going to go, <coughs> go forward. And we had, therefore, the IMF take control. All these countries had entered into a voluntary bankruptcy. And from that point on, with the voluntary bankruptcy, let's just use the United States, but it's, a, it's, it, it's relevant whether you're in Australia, Canada, United Kingdom, France, or Germany. Germany don't even talk about it as a defeated uh, war power. So what we end up with is we end up now moving from common law, because from, since 1933, there was no lawful money to back contract. From 1933, and the same in, in the United Kingdom in 1931, with what's called the, the, the uh, Gold Standard Amendment Act, we've been shifted all onto the private side of the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England. And now, because we had moved into bankruptcy, common law did not apply as law on the land because when a sovereign nation declares bankruptcy, everything moves into maritime law of the sea and admiralty law. This is why no matter what people are trying to do in the courts by trying to declare themselves a natural person to try and describe themselves as John of the family Doe, it doesn't work because they haven't collapsed the trusts that have been put in place to control these mechanisms. What it also does show 
is contrary to what you might be thinking there in the United States or in Australia or in Canada, why Trudeau can do whatever he wants, or Jacinda Ahern can do whatever she wants, and in Australia the same, is because these people, let's use the United States as the example to finish off part one, the Attorney General of the United States, the Secretary of State, uh, which used to be Pompeo, I think it's Merrick now, or is he the, uh, the other one? I don't know. These are all in the pay of foreign entities. There is no United States Constitution, hence there is no rule of law. That's why people like um, Roger Stone, Steve Bannon, um, uh, and many others, whose names I can't think of now, don't get a fair hearing in the court. They don't, the judges don't even have to look to the opinion of the jury. In admiralty courts, they can do whatever they want. So there is a, a bait and switch going on here. People are being allowed to think there is a constitution still in place, but since the bankruptcy, it's not there. Why other do you think that the members of Congress and Senate are allowed to make themselves so wealthy and there are so many scandals that are allowed to erupt because they're actually knowing full well that the judiciary, the executive and the legislative branch, all the United States Marshals and all the sheriffs are being paid by the IMF. This I will prove and show you in the next video. So the World Bank Group and the IMF and the Bank for International Settlements, which was formed in 1930 and on the Swedish delegation for Bretton Woods insisted that it be uh, uh, abolished prior to the signing of Bretton Woods 1944. And everyone, the second committee, agreed, yet it wasn't enacted. And one of the reasons it wasn't, because Roosevelt got assassinated or poisoned to death in 45 prior to uh, Truman taking over, and then we were into a whole different realm of nuclear bombs being led off. So that's as far as I want to go. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being very patient. Um, these notes on here might help you um, just for something to, to go, go through. Um, I think if we just focus on them a little bit. Um, it's, a, it's an indication uh, if I could do videos and I could edit a little better, which I hope to start learning to do in the new year now, uh, then we'll, we'll do, do, do better. But these are the messages. The messages are very important. It doesn't matter whether it's written on a, a piece of towel or whether it's on a, a, a luxurious presentation. It's the knowledge being passed over to you. So where we're going in part two is from 1945 up till more or less now, and then it's going to conclude with showing you how to conduct yourself in a courtroom and how you will foreclose and you become the plaintiff foreclosing on the illegal and fraudulent activities of the governments and the Congress and the Senate and the governmental ministries that supposedly are looking after your interests but are not. It's a sham and it's a fraud and I'll show you how and why. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe and pass it on to whoever you feel would benefit from listening. Thank you.